Welcome everybody to uh, Post Grand Rounds interview with Dr. Robert Hedea, who's a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University Medical School and a renowned psychiatrist in the field of applying the model of functional medicine and systems thinking to psychiatry and sort of breaking apart our traditional notions of why mental illness um, occurs and how to deal with the root causes of it. In fact, uh, I, it kind of reminded me after listening to his grand rounds at Cleveland Clinic today about a conversation I had with Thomas Insel, who when I asked him about the DSM-5 or the DSM-4 at the time, he said, he thought it had 100% accuracy and 0% validity, meaning it was very accurate in describing the symptoms and categorizing people according to their symptoms of mental illness, but not valid because it didn't describe the root causes or the etiology. And I think we just heard today from Dr. Hedea about a variety of factors that are driving mental illness, particularly depression, but I think it applies across the spectrum of uh, mental illness including nutritional factors, hormonal factors, immunological factors, gut microbiome factors. He alluded to the role of environmental toxins in mental illness. And all of these factors are fairly ignored when looking at and mental illness. And, and I think I just want to really welcome you, Dr. Dea, to Thanks Cleveland Clinic, to uh, Grand Rounds here in Cleveland Clinic, and to sort of help us to understand the role of uh, functional medicine and psychiatry. Right. And I, uh, years ago, I wrote a book called The Ultra Mind Solution, which was about how the body affects the brain. And traditional psychiatrists have typically think, think of the brain as in the head and the mind as something that's sort of sitting on the top of your shoulders, it's disconnected and unrelated through the blood brain barrier. But mm -hmm. as we now know, there are a variety of factors that are going on all the time that can be modified. And you presented some very compelling stories and cases of patients who had really treatment resistant depression um, and, 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 and symptoms that were relatively easily modified through some simple application of functional medicine. So tell us how you got into this and how did you kind of first mm -hmm. come to like figure out that, uh, you know, psychopharmacology wasn't God's gift to mankind. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it started probably in my internship where I was giving a woman, uh, her potassium was low and I was giving her K-Lite. And I thought, you know, why should I give her K-Lite? Why don't I give her a banana with every meal? <laughs> <laughs> and I nearly killed her with three bananas a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Really, the way it happened is I was uh, treating a woman with panic disorder mm. and I, in uh, really early in my practice, and I did all the standard stuff, mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. therapy, and then I tried mm -hmm. mipramine, and that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And then I tried Xanax, which was new at the mm -hmm. time. I was like, this is going to work. Didn't work. And a year into uh, her treatment, she paged me on a Saturday night. I remember I was dancing at a wedding. And we had the beepers back then, mm -hmm. and the beeper went off, and I mm -hmm. found the phone booth and called her, and she says, I'm having a panic attack. And I'm like, what? I'm missing something here, you know? So I went into the office Monday morning, and I looked at her chart, and I had a CBC, and I saw that her MCV was 101. Uh -huh. Now, I was trained, you know, it's a little bit out of the range, just don't, don't worry about pay it. attention right. to it, right? So I said, you know, maybe B12 deficiency. So I did a Schillings test and she came out positive. And I said, all right, B12 for you. In days, her panic was gone. Uh -huh. And I was like, whoa, you know, like the head is connected to body by this thing called the neck, right. you know? Right. <laughs> and it was like, really, what else am I missing? Because right. in psychiatry, we really used to talk about a revolving door. You know, you'd, you'd go into treatment, then you'd leave treatment, then you'd show up at another psychiatrist's office. Right. Because the problem wasn't being addressed. Right. So I thought, what am I, what am I missing? And one thing led to another. You know, you just look for truth. Right. Look for what the science well, says, so and, and that's, you end up, in functional medicine. I mean, it's so fascinating because, you know, most of the time we see someone with a panic disorder, we think it's a psychiatric problem. It's some trauma, it's PTSD, it's mm -hmm. some psychiatric issue. And uh, sometimes it is, right? Sometimes it well, is. Well, you, can, you but, don't but, separate it. But, uh, you know, but if you, you have someone with a massive, you know, life debilitating condition like panic disorder mm -hmm. and you give them a B12 and they get better like what you know <laughs> I mean I remember a guy came to see me a few years ago who was an executive he he was having severe panic attacks in the afternoon thought he was having a heart attack he was short of breath his 
his palpitations, right. he couldn't breathe, he was anxious, he thought he was gonna die. And it was really debilitating for him mm -hmm. every afternoon, about two or three o'clock. And so, so what, is, what is your lifestyle like? He says, well, you know, I go out at night after work, we drink, we eat late, I, you know, then I'm not hungry in the morning, I don't eat all day, I'm working, and then like at these things at two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm like, well, he was insulin resistant, he got hypoglycemic, mm -hmm. he was like, right. it was his, you know, was diet and lifestyle, right. it was like, just right. eat breakfast and don't right. do this, and it's like, it went away, it wasn't that. Right. Hard, but if you listen to people's right. stories, you can often find the clues. Well, the trick, the, the key is you think, uh, this woman that I'm telling you about, she was 50 years old, mm -hmm. she had a bad marriage, her only child was going off to school. Mm -hmm. I thought she had panic because she was thinking about separating. Right. That's what I thought. That was my working hypothesis, right? right? We attach no. meaning to psychiatric disorders that often is a mistake. Right. And I think, right. This is really one of the fundamental flaws of psychiatry is that we have these myths and metaphors for why we think people are right. mentally ill. Right. And you know, now we call it a neurochemical imbalance and it's psychopharmacology, but I remember reading a book called Madness and Civilization when I was in mm -hmm. college about the varieties of perception around mental illness That's over the right. ages. It was, you know, it was being inhabited right. by angels or been inhabited <laughs> by devils or by, you know, like That's there was right. a different time. Exorcism, It was right. by, you know, sage, right. you know, it's like it was right. a revered condition right. in certain That's cultures. Right. And other times they were just right. locked away and That's right. treated as witches or whatever, you know. That's right. And, and so we have, now we have a very, you know, clinical version of it. And I, I think the, the, the thing that I want to sort of dig into with you is when, when you were talking in your, in your lecture about inflammation, and depression. It's not something most psychiatrists think about. How is the brain inflamed and how could that lead to brain dysfunction mm -hmm. and particularly depression? Mm -hmm. I've seen this over and over in my practice where you know I've seen people who have severe clinical depression and they tend to have all these other quote comorbid inflammatory problems, sinus right. issues, eczema, food allergies, right. whatever. And it's stunning when you start to deal with those things the mental issues go away. So to talk to us about some of the research and the information about this, because I, I once saw a paper that showed that people on TNF al alpha blockers have less depression, right? Right. Or people who take interferon for hepatitis or MS, they get, they more get actually more depression because right. it creates more inflammation. Right, so, so, so the, the deal is this. I mean, the, the process is that, first of all, we know there are at least three pathways by which inflammation in the body is transmitted to the brain. Yeah. Uh, it could be carrier molecules carrying the inflammatory messages across the blood brain barrier. It could be through the vagus nerve. You know, there are different pathways, right? Yeah. So, what happens in the brain, though, is when it receives th these signals that there's inflammation, is you have activation of the microglia, the, one of the two types of immune cells in the brain, and they release glutamate. And glutamate is obviously a necessary excitatory neurotransmitter. Right? It's an excitotoxin in a sense. In, it's, high in high doses, it's toxic, right? right? So the micro, microglia are putting out more glutamate, and then the astroglia are not cleaning it up. And then also what happens is you have this indole dioxygenase enzyme that gets activated by inflammation, and that steals tryptophan, the precursor for serotonin, away from making serotonin to this inflammatory pathway that makes quinolinic acid, which stimulates the NMDA receptors, which release more glutamate. So you have this glutamate storm, mm -hmm. and you have a low GABA, and you have high glutamate, and you have low serotonin, and, and so neurochemically, you have inflammation in the brain. It's not that the brain is swelling outside of the skull, but you have microscopic or uh, you know, molecular inflammation in the brain that changes the neurochemistry of the brain dramatically, and you get depression, you get anxiety, you have memory problems, you have sleep problems, yeah. and, uh, and uh, with cortisol changes. I mm -hmm. mean, there, there's a whole host of changes that happen within minutes yeah. of inflammation, mm. within minutes. And you'll hear this from patients when they eat certain foods, yeah. You know, they'll have inflammation, they'll get foggy headed mm -hmm. within minutes. Yeah. Uh, they did a study where they actually infused lipopolysaccharide IV into 20 normal volunteers. Well, that sounds like fun. How do you find <laughs> normal volunteers? I don't know. It's an oxymoron, right? right? right, right. <laughs> but they, that's what they did. And within, uh, they tracked at three hours, six hours, nine hours, 10 hours, they tracked interleukin one, two, six, mm -hmm. TNF alpha, mm -hmm. cortisol. Mm -hmm. And what they found is a very tight correlation between anxiety, mood, mm -hmm. uh, memory problems, 
and the cytokines and the cortisol, they were tightly correlated. And these were doses of LPS, lipopolysaccharide, that were not enough to make these participants feel sick. Right, it's typically what you'd get if you have a leaky gut, right? It's even less than even that. Even less. So right. if you have a leaky gut, you're getting a massive yeah. antigenic assault. Yeah. Right, and that has a big effect on the brain. So, so in terms of the, the inflammation, is it, is it working by interrupting enzymes or is it working by just activating the microglia? Or well, so, so it's activating this 2,3-indole dioxygenase, mm -hmm. right? IDO. IDO, right? right, which shunts the tryptophan down a different pathway. And you can measure that on organic acid you with quinolinate. Quinolate, kynurenic acid, kynurenic acid, and quinolinate. You can measure that organic yeah. acids, and you have. If you measure, you'll see markers of uh, serotonin 5-HIAA. Mm -hmm. That'll be lower. Mm -hmm. If you measure melatonin, which comes from serotonin, yeah. that will be lower. So basically, you've had uh, That's switching why stations. Inflammation of sleep issues. That's right. Right. That's exactly right. And they'll they'll be low in melatonin. They won't be. Able, they'll be anxious because serotonin will be low. There's an inverse relationship with serotonin and dopamine. So when serotonin goes low, the dopaminergic pathways actually get activated. So now you're kind of between the glutamate and the you're, dopamine, you're kind of you're activated and anxious, yeah. overstimulated, you can't sleep, you know, and uh, you'll have more anxiety, more OCD, more depression. Mm -hmm. so, so how would you sort of address people with that sort of inflammatory depression? So the, the first quick thing to do uh, is maybe give some 5-HTP, not tryptophan, but 5-HTP, just so they can get something going down that 5-HTP serotonin pathway, right, melatonin. But the key thing is get to the source of the inflammation. Where is the inflammation coming from? That's what you gotta know. Mm. You gotta get some markers, you know, look at the CRP or the SED rate or the C4A or C3. So know. in clinical practice, what are the like top three things that are driving inflammation in this patient's with depression? What I see is infection, I see foods. Um, like food sensitivities? Food sensitivities, gluten. yeah, IgG type of food sensitivities. Gluten's huge, all, I would say all grains. Really we now know that it's not even gluten but just wheat in general and, and all grains. People have sensitivities, we don't yeah. necessarily fully understand exactly why, but mm -hmm. they do. Could it be lectins uh, or could, could it yeah, be? Yeah, it could be lectins, I mean, so, so the food, the diet is number one, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say infection is. Is it, is it is it also the not just the food sensitivities, but is it the the macronutrient composition and also glycemic index of foods? Right, and exactly. The yep. Fats. I mean, all these macronutrients right. play a role, right? That's right. That's right. We we know that the, the what I see is very interesting in clinical practice. If you're talking about macronutrients, just on a day to day basis, and this is a, a useful thing to know. When people come in and say, my mood is bouncing all over the place, mm -hmm. and so you ask, well, what do you mean? Is it within the day or is it, you know, over the course of the week? Yeah. If it's within the day, you know it's macronutrients, right? Yeah. You know that they're not maintaining a glycemic balance, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very simple to, to deal with. You just help them, educate them on appropriate diet, yeah. and you'll have more mood stability and, of course, uh, the, the, the downstream effects of adequate fiber mm -hmm. and a well-balanced diet and good macro, micronutrients and macronutrients, is, I mean, it affects the whole body. Mm -hmm. right? So you've got, you've got the macronutrients, you've got food sensitivities around food, and the next thing for inflammation is infections. Right. What are you talking about? It could be anything from periodontal disease. What I see, actually, yeah. is I'll see uh, Lyme, I'll see Babesia, Bartonella, Bartonella, sometimes I'll see parasitic infections, Candida, uh, sinusitis, very common, chronic sinusitis, uh, very, very common. Uh, so there are a just, lot of neuropsych yeah. reactions to tick-borne infections, which is often sure. missed and overlooked. Yeah. I just have had a patient who has had a lot of cognitive issues and depression, and you know, he turned out he had uh, very high titers of IgM to Ehrlichia, which had right. been overlooked. Right. You know, yeah. and it's you, very if you don't know how to be an inflammologist, mm -hmm. right, and <laughs> and go down the rabbit holes of what the clinical history and also physical diagnostic lab tests for inflammation, you often miss these things. That's right. So while well, you start out by taking a good history, and you can mm -hmm. pick that up, but uh, Lyme disease is epidemic, and of course the tick. 
uh, carries other diseases as yeah. well, so we have to be well versed in that. So it's not about uh, treating the symptom of inflammation with NSAIDs, yeah. you know, right? Well, I read something on biologics. The patients who are on biologics have less depression. That's right. And then they're like, well, we should use, you know, right. Humira for <laughs> right. depression. Right. What a concept. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of scary because yeah. every study, that's what they say. This is in, indicates that there are new targets for drug use in depression. And it's yeah. like, we don't, that, thank you. We have enough. <laughs> Let's get to the source. You know? so, so, so you're saying basically macronutrient balance to mm -hmm. balance the glycemic load index of the diet. We didn't talk about fast, so we can get into that mm -hmm. in a minute. Dealing with food sensitivities, particularly gluten, and dealing with uh, inflammation from infections, also food sensitivities, what other things besides well, infection? Well, a lot of things that cause inflammation. Stress causes inflammation. Mm -hmm. Sleep deprivation causes mm -hmm. inflammation. Sedentary lifestyle causes inflammation. Mold causes inflammation. Toxins in your environment cause mm -hmm. inflammation. Yeah. All right. I mean, there's a long list of things that cause inflammation. It's right? actually a relatively short list. It's toxins, microbes, allergens, poor diet, stress, right? Sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation. You know, traveling across time zones repeatedly as part of your lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, it's. Other it, stresses, you know, right? Depends Those how are, you I would say stresses down. are in that like category. Of, yeah. yeah. The stresses of lack of sleep, the stresses of lack of exercise, the stresses of yeah. time zone travel. Those are all various points of yeah. like, you know, allostatic load on the system. Right. right. So um, then the third thing you said besides infections and inflammation and, and the food, it was the third major thing you see as a driver. Hormonal issues? I, I, um, hormones would be there, but probably stress. Stress. Probably stress because that's ubiquitous, you know. It's not that hormonal uh, issues are not present in yeah. depression. I mean, they're, yeah. they're all over the place. I mean, I, I don't really find too many patients with depression who don't have hormonal yeah. issues. Uh, but if you're talking about, uh, I, don't, I don't think of... Maybe when it comes to glucoregulation, I, I mean, I think about inflammation mm -hmm, there, you know, but mm -hmm. I think of inflammation uh, really coming uh, much of it from stress, mm. you know. Interesting, you know, I was just uh, at a conference with Deepak Chopra, we're talking about the effects of meditation and the research they're doing, mm -hmm. looking at its effect on gene expression and cytokines mm -hmm, right. and a whole host of things. And, right. you know, Dan Harris, who was a uh, who's a Nightline, who's a uh, TV reporter personality. He, he was on live television in front of millions of people, I think mm. it was Asia or something, and he had a panic, full-blown panic attack. Then he started, really? Yeah, and he started <laughs> meditating, uh, and it changed uh, his life, and he wrote a book called 10% right. Happier, you know? Uh, right, right. And I, you know, I right. used to meditate quite a bit, and then I sort of stopped for many mm. years, and I restarted recently, and I mm. noticed that, you know, even amidst all the various things I'm doing and the stress that, that my level of anxiety went way down, I even know I was anxious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my energy improved and, and my mood improved, even though mm -hmm. I didn't think I was depressed or mm -hmm. sad, but my, my outlook and my mood is dramatically improved yeah. just by a simple mm -hmm. technique, which is 20 minutes twice a day. And I think yeah. we underestimate the power of these, these things on us. Meditation is interesting because people hear it and they go, whoa, meditation. Can't do it, right. Yeah, I don't know what that is. And then there are so many techniques, but it's so, so simple. It's so easy. So simple, so and I have found the same thing, that it actually reorients your 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 attitude yeah. about life. Yeah, you know? it's like effortless, right. You know, I, after I started meditating, my wife and I were having a conversation, and she said something, whatever it was, and I just paused and she says, you were doing a little meditation there, weren't you? Because <laughs> I, I didn't You close react. your eyes and go, la, 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 la. <laughs> no, so. it's, it's, meditation's fabulous, yeah. it, but, you know, engaging in exercise mm -hmm. that you enjoy or mm -hmm. hobbies or, I mean, a lot of things. There are many things to do. Okay, so let's talk about my fav favorite topic is fat and the brain mm -hmm. and depression. So mm -hmm. in your talk, you, you emphasize the role of EPA as an omega-3 fat. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was more beneficial than DHA. Mm -hmm. And you know, we often hear that like, DHA is, is better for the brain because most of the brain is made up of DHA. It's mm -hmm. important for ADD, for intellectual development, right. for dementia. Right. Right. So why is EPA more effective for depression? I, the truth is I can't answer that. I mean, I wonder I if it has, I'm, I'm sure you do. That's why you asked me the question. <laughs> so, no, the, but I, I, I've read about it having anti-inflammatory effects, yeah. of course, yeah. but, but the, 
It's, it is clear that that's more effective for depression, mm -hmm. and D, DHA actually has obviously other roles mm -hmm. uh, to fill critical, mm -hmm. really. But uh, so I'd like to hear from you. What's I think it's what I what you were saying. I think it, it uh, two things I think are important. One is it regulates inflammation; it's more anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. and second is that it um, activates PPAR, mm -hmm. uh, these nuclear receptors that are regulating inflammation, mm -hmm. that are regulating insulin resistance and right. insulin sensitivity, and it may have an impact on, on that as well. That makes sense. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and then, you know, you mentioned something in your lecture, which, um, you know, I, I sort of question, which is, that, you know, that we've seen bad diets increase, including saturated fat, which may be linked to depression. And from, you know, first of all, just in terms of the, the data, our intake of saturated fat mm -hmm. has gone down. Our intake of yeah. beef, yeah. tallow, lard, and butter has gone down by 50% over the last 100 right. years. And our intake of omega-6 refined vegetable oils, up. like corn oil, soybean oil, canola, have gone up by 40%. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's really good research from um, Dr. Hibble and his group at NIH around the increasing use of omega-6s in processed food and the food supply that um, have been linked to suicide, homicide, violence, mm -hmm. uh, depression. Um, and, and, uh, and I wonder if you sort of have any thoughts about that. And Well, I know, uh, maybe you know Dr. Boriscano, he gives a good mm -hmm. lecture on uh, omega-6s and violence. Uh, so there is, yeah. data, there is data about that. Um, yeah, so I wasn't meaning to imply that saturated fat consumption itself went up, but I was really talking about the general American diet, which is really definitely uh, much worse now than certainly than it was when I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, but I, I think what you're saying is true about the omega-6s. I see that in many of my patients when I measure their omega fatty acids, mm -hmm. RBC, EFA, EFA, I see the omega-6s are high. Yeah. I think that's right. And they're pro-inflammatory, right? So, so, so macronutrients, sugar, the fast treat, what about protein quality? Is that, how does that play a role in, in depression? Well, I think you need to have a, a broad type of protein intake. I, I'm a little concerned that a lot of people rely on these, well, maybe not across America, but there are groups of people who rely on protein shakes. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's fine here and there, but you want a broad array of proteins. So you, you want some animal protein, you want some fish protein, you want some various types of proteins because they all have different amino acid balances. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's important. Yeah, and, and what about um, the role of toxins? Because we, we didn't have a chance to go through it in the grand right. rounds, but right. you know, my experience is that people who have heavy metals, uh, including myself, when I had heavy metal toxicity, I noticed huge impacts on my mood, my mm -hmm. sleep, anxiety, stress, and, and I've seen many patients who had treatment-resistant depression or psychiatric mm -hmm. illnesses. So and, toxins are, are huge, so if we talk a little bit about mercury, for example. Yeah. There's a University of Calgary has a great video. Mm -hmm. If you Google uh, neurotoxin mercury University of Calgary, you'll see a video that shows how mercury actually it disrupts tubulin and the ability to make n new neurons. Yeah. Um, that uh, mercury has been known for years to cause psychiatric problems, but it's they been thought the about. It's called the Mad Hatter, right? Right, the Mad Hatter. exactly, Mad the Hatter. It felt, which Mad, is stiffened by that's mercury. Exactly right. And all but, these but, hatters got <laughs> crazy. <laughs> and maybe we're turning into Mad Hatters, I don't know. But, mm -hmm. uh, but we're exposed to mercury at a lower level, but it's still neurotoxic, mm -hmm, so that has mm -hmm. to be assessed. Mm -hmm. And then we have, I talked about the endocrine disrupting chemicals there. It's uh, massive, massive. Mm -hmm. There have been over 1,300 studies on endocrine disruptors, and clearly, since they're endocrine disruptors, they affect the brain. Yeah, right. And we've been so. talking about this for decades in functional medicine. Right. I just saw a paper come out this week in the Journal of the American Medical Association on endocrine disrupting chemicals and our mm -hmm. massive exposure, mm -hmm. the grandfathering in of so many of these chemicals into our food right. supply, right. into our body care products and to right. household products that have never right. been really adequately tested. Yeah, no, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, briefly in the lecture about how uh, it's a tri tributyl tin is yeah. what it's called. And yeah. this is put in paints so yeah. that the paints don't have a foul smell. Yeah. And it shows up in seafood. And it's now shown the, that it dissociates the hypothalamic CRH stimulus 
which sends a message mm. to the pituitary mm -hmm. to release ACTH, it actually dissociates that stimulus. Mm -hmm. so your brain is saying, come on, give me more you know, ACTH, but the pituitary is not responding, mm. right? And that's- How does a fish get the- I guess it's from dumping and, mm. and going into the, mm. uh, you know, the common uh, not pool. not paint chips. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I want to sort of digress to another topic, which is the microbiome, because mm -hmm. You alluded to it in your talk, and and you know we we never thought that the gut flora could play a role in mental illness, right? right? And right. Uh, I think in functional medicine we've clinically observed for decades that when you fix people's gut, their mood gets better, their depression right. gets better. We never quite understood what was happening. Uh, we've seen studies where antibiotic use has been linked to depression. We've mm -hmm. seen. Uh, studies on sort of irritable bowel, where it may be sure. not that the, you know, we always learned in medical school that these patients were anxious right. and had psychiatric issues, right. which is why they had irritable bowel. Right. But it may be that the irritable bowel is causing an irritable brain, not the other right. way around. Or both ways. Or both, by, yeah, bi-directional. Right. So, right. so the question is, you know, what is the emerging evidence around the microbiome and gut health on the brain and depression and psychiatric disorders? So, so there's a, a lot of evidence that there's a linkage. There's no question of linkage, and there's no question that the linkage goes both ways and is bi-directional. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, there's no, we're not at a point where we can say, take these specific species of probiotics and your mood will get better. Yeah. And that's not, that would be the same as saying, take this particular drug for your mood. That's sure. too, redu too reductionistic. Sure. But right. we do know that by having a diverse microbiome and, uh, and correcting the gut and reducing the inflammation from there, that we're affecting the neurochemistry in the brain, mm. which relates directly to psychiatric disorders and depression. So it's really about, um, having a diverse microbiome and, and correcting deficiencies in pathogenic bacteria and organisms in the mm -hmm. gut and strengthening the barrier, the gut immune barrier, mm -hmm. and uh, through all the methods, we talk about diet and supplements mm -hmm. and, and et cetera, and that clearly takes a layer of inflammation out of the body, thereby helping the brain. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen, maybe you have, but I haven't seen a study that says let's take a hundred patients with depression and treat their gut and see how they do. No. But I am sure that we would see a significant improvement. Would that take the depressed patient all the way to recovery? Maybe not, but would right. it improve a significant layer? For I mean, sure. That was really important, I think, as a take home in your talk, which is that when you did your case studies, it sort of reminded me of um, Dale Bredesen and his 36 holes in the roof right. model right. where That's right. you didn't just correct methylation, you didn't just right. correct the thyroid, you didn't just correct the adrenals, you didn't right. just correct the gut flora, you just didn't deal with the infections. Right. You dealt with all of it. That's what you have to do. You deal with all of it and right. you do it sequentially and you do right. it in the right phases and steps. That's but right. you showed, you know, over 10 months you took people from really treatment resistant depression right. to recovery right. That's right. without any change in medication. That's right. And it's a regular occurrence. I mean, yeah, it's, not, I have, it's not an anomaly. It's, right. I'm a psychopharmacologist. I was certified as a psychopharmacologist, but I have slowly actually learned that I don't need to do much in psychopharmacology anymore. Yeah. Do you I, take people off medication? I take people off medication. I treat pa patients with bipolar type 2, the milder form of bipolar uh -huh. 2, without medication, yeah. successfully, yeah. routinely. If someone comes in with a severe depression and they need medication, that's fine. Use medication, but get moving on these other things. Do a complete history. So it's a bridge history. to when you get all this other if, stuff. Yeah, if up. you have to have that bridge, you use it. I am not against the meds. Mm -hmm. I'm against complete reliance on them, and we know from the data now that they, their efficacy is limited. In polypharmacy, there's no evidence on polypharmacy, right? There's no evidence of like applying four or five drugs in well, patients. Well, the STAR-D study shows a very small increase in the number of people who remit from their depression yeah. when you use polypharmacy, but it's a very small, like the juice isn't worth the squeeze, really. You but know? we talk about evidence-based medicine, but when you really look at you know combining all these various medications and psychopharmacology, there are no clinical trials combining three, four, or five medications in patients, seeing how they do, which ones to combine. I mean, there's no evidence well, around no, that. Well, no, the evidence is that in the study where they combined different medications, right. that they there was could, a little bit improvement, they could get but it wasn't like, should you apply this one and this one and no, this no, one? No, it was like no. random. It's, 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 so, it's the theory is different mechanisms, right? Right. And that's the theory, but that's not proven, mm -hmm. really. Right. 
Yeah. yeah. So I think when we talk about evidence-based medicine, yeah. I think the emperor well. has no clothes here. <laughs> <laughs> this is unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. it's pretty disturbing. Yeah. It's, you know. So, um, you know, I want to also talk about micronutrients because mm -hmm. I think you mentioned a few things around that that I, I thought were interesting. One was that, you know, we often miss by not looking for common mm -hmm. micronutrient deficiencies, zinc, copper zinc imbalances, methylation problems, iron deficiency, mm -hmm. you know, magnesium deficiency, mm -hmm. you mentioned calcium deficiency, there's others for sure. So, um, and the one thing that sort of, I remember reading a number of years ago is that in women who are over 65 and who are depressed, 25% of them had a methylation issue with either inadequate B12 or folate that wasn't measured typically with a folate right. measurement or even a red cell folate right. or even a B12 level. Right and that you had to look at other indicators. And right. typically we look at homocysteine and we look at methylmalonic acid, but you were challenging the wisdom in functional medicine of using mm -hmm. methylmalonic acid as mm -hmm. a biomarker for right. B12. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I was using methylmalonic acid uh, myself and I actually never saw much benefit to it and I did some research. And you didn't see frequent elevations of it? Or? No, I didn't. Uh, but everybody was using it, and so I was looking. Yeah. But I found this paper that I alluded to, I think it was in Clinical Chemistry in 2008, yeah. and what they found is they could only account, based on known biological mm -hmm. pathways, they could only account for 17% of the variation in methylmalonic acid. Mm -hmm. Out of that 17%, B12 uh, actually only accounted for a small portion. So. The methylmalonic acid level is determined by many factors we don't know, and B12 is a small factor there. Therefore, mm. measuring MMA is not really clinically useful. Neither is B12 levels. So. Not, I think neither is B12 level. That's why I said you need to look at... So what's at, a doc to do? You know, the, you look at the CBC, look for anemia, look for MCV. Is it large? Make sure it's not being... Uh, the macrocytosis not being masked by an iron deficiency or other causes of microcytosis. Mm -hmm. Look at the homocysteine, MTHFR SNP if you can do that. Look at their age. As you get older, you know you need more B12. You have trouble absorbing it. The parietal cells don't make intrinsic factors. Although people's levels are less than 500, there's probably an issue, right? It, but many, yes, I, I would so say if their level is six or 700 and have a neuropsychiatric problem, there's probably an issue. Yeah, so maybe that so, there's false negatives, but you know, very few false, false positives. False positives, right. right. If it's low, but, it's low. But where the range is, I believe the lower limit is like about 280 yeah, or something. Yeah, well, you're screwed by that. And you're like, <laughs> no, please, don't go by well, that. Well, you know, what people yeah. don't realize is that those typical lab tests are usually two standard deviations right. from the mean in the large right. population, whether you're two years old or 92. Right. And right. so really maybe we need to shrink them shrink to one it. standard yeah, exactly. deviation. Yeah. And, and move it up. Yeah, move it up. With the B12, I say yeah. you got to move it up. For sure, because yeah. I've seen it clinically, and if you if you do this dynamic uh, assessment, in other words, dynamic in your mind, mm -hmm. imagining the microcytosis, the macrocytosis, mm -hmm. where's the homocysteine, mm -hmm. where's that methylation cycle, what is what are the medications, how old is the patient, do they have a bacterial overgrowth of this small intestine, you know, what are all the factors mm -hmm. related to mm -hmm. B12, and then they have a neuropsychiatric problem, you know, it's pretty safe to give B12. Yeah. You know, now, if you're going to give massive doses, oh, doses over a long time, we don't know what that does. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty safe as a, a trial to see if people... Yeah, and, and I often see doctors who are patients who are supplementing B12, their levels will be high right. because it, the, the reference ranges are for unsupplemented. Right. And so the doctors say, oh, you're B12 toxic, stop right. the B12. Stop the B12, but it's not intracellular right. either. Right. Right? We want and it's it. also water-soluble, right. it's not toxic, and right. the levels you know, right. not... Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's great. So are there any other pearls of wisdom that you want to share around functional medicine psychiatry? Yeah, and I mean, another pet peeve of mine is the thyroid. Mm. Okay, so it's a big deal because um, it has a major effect in, in psychiatric problems. So uh, the NHANE study I referred to said that the mean TSH in this country is 1.5. And that mm -hmm. was a study of 16 and a half thousand people. So, a clinician who's looking at someone with depression really needs to look at the TSH, look at the free T3, mm -hmm. look at the free T4. Mm -hmm. I like the reverse T3. I know endocrinologists think that that's mm -hmm. not, they even feel that free T3 is not relevant. The free T3 in the body doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on in the brain. The brain actually modulates T3 
pretty well on mm -hmm. its own, but we, we, we don't have measures for that. So mm -hmm. I'm very careful. I want the TSH to be 1.5 or a little lower. I want the free T3 to be in the middle of its range. And obviously that's in concert with physical exam and sure. symptoms. And, and I think that's critical. And the last thing I'll say is that there was a, a large study of over 17,000 people that looked at the risk of fractures and atrial fibrillation with an elderly population over 65, yeah. right? And this study showed that they looked for what's the TSH that normalizes the risk of AFib and fracture in this older population. So you would think it'd be like 1.5, right? right. It turns out that the risk of AFib and fractures actually normalize if your TSH is subnormal at 0.04 to 0.4. Wow. This is a huge study. That's amazing. So you have to, I'm not saying hyper, you know, Although if you treat, treat people, people with a bioidentical thyroid, their TSH is always suppressed because the T3 is the feedback loop. So right. if you're giving T3, it'll cause the suppression, it'll cause suppression. of the TSH. So often right. doctors say, oh, your TSH is too low, right. but if you look at the T3 and 4, but you do um, want to watch, uh, make sure they don't develop AFib, uh, you know, yeah. and watch the DEXA scan if they're on long term. But, yeah, but I'm saying there's leeway. Biomarkers of urinary in, uh, yeah. absorption. And, and I'm saying there's leeway in depression to push the TSH below 1.5. Yeah. Frankly, I, I'll treat, I want the TSH again within the context of symptoms uh, below one if I'm treating a treatment resistant depression. And I want that free T3 to be in the mid range. What I find fascinating is that, uh, you know, in traditional endocrinology, they don't really treat with T3 and they often will um, be very concerned about giving T3. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet in psychiatry, it's often one of the sort of sort of tricks in the bag that they right. use for treatment resistant depression is right. T3 even in the face of normal thyroid, which right. I find right. fascinating. Well, be, remember the 5-HT1A receptor I showed you, uh -huh. you need that T3 um, to help the receptor function, but obviously many other functions mm -hmm. to thyroid hormone, mm -hmm. but it, it does seem to work. But I would, if I had someone with completely normal thyroid functions, I don't really use thyroid yeah. uh, to augment. I look for the other causes. Yeah, of course, mm -hmm. and often, you know, people's adrenals are not working, their right. thyroid's not working properly, right. and right. if people have thyroid antibodies, they may not have abnormal thyroid tests, but they're actually right you know, not functioning it right. properly. Yeah. Right. So it's really interesting. So, so but basically mental illness is often resulting from changes in the matrix, inflammation, changes in the gut flora and microbiome, nutritional status, macro and micronutrients, toxins, mm -hmm. you know, hormonal imbalances, adrenal mm -hmm. thyroid issues. That's right. Stress, all these factors are modifiable through understanding how to work with the matrix and use the lens of functional medicine to identify the unique causes. Because if you That's see, right. you know, 10 patients with depression, they might have 10 different causes. And I always say because we know the name of the disease doesn't mean we know the cause. It's and just a syndrome. Is, it's right. a syndrome, right. Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, that's the, the Sidney Baker model of name it, mm -hmm. blame it, and tame it. You name the disease, mm -hmm. oh, I know why you're sad and hopeless and helpless. You have depression, <laughs> that's why you feel like that. No, it's just the cause, <laughs> the name right. we give to people who share those symptoms. Right. That's and right. there could be dozens of causes. That's right, and there are. And in each individual, it's quite different. So what you're saying mm -hmm. is there's no one size fits all for using functional medicine. It's basically looking at that individual, doing a thorough history, mm -hmm. doing the right diagnostics, figuring right. out where the issues are, and right. then targeting those, those problems. And when you do that, not only are you helping their mental health, but you find that the comorbid conditions- Everything else goes away. Everything else goes away. You right? can't just treat the brain, you treat the system, the body. and then everything else right. goes better, that's right? right? That's, that's right, that's right. Well, welcome to Cleveland Clinic, and well, thank you for, for, having me. for being here and sharing your wisdom of decades of, of knowledge. And you know, Bob and I, we actually were in the same graduating mm -hmm. class at the Applying Functional Medicine Clinical Practice back in the 90s. And here we are today <laughs> at fabulous. Cleveland Clinic. <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Oh, no. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. <laughs> and you. we're going to be doing Grand Rounds again, Functional Medicine Grand Rounds, December 13th, mark your calendar, with Dr. Alessia Fasano from Harvard, who's world's expert in gluten and non-gluten celiac, uh, non-celiac uh, gluten sensitivity, as well as leaky gut and autoimmune disease. So it's going to be a fascinating conversation we'll have with him, Grand Rounds as well, and I uh, look forward to seeing you there.